this quote, I can live without doubt, or I can live with doubt, sorry, and uncertainty. I think it is much more interesting to live not knowing than, than to have answers that might be wrong. This is a quote by Richard Feynman, arguably one of the most influential um, and brilliant theoretical physicists of the latter 20th century. He's a Nobel Prize winner, and he was also actually a major player in the uh, discovery of what caused the um, crash of the uh, Challenger. Now, he was also known as being an incredibly inspirational mentor and teacher, and was actually known for his ability to be able to explain extremely complex theoretical, the theoretical concepts in very simplistic terms. Now, his discoveries were really driven by this an insatiable curiosity and the lack of fear of the unknown. And so what I'm here today, what I'm hoping to do, is to actually convince every one of you that we all have the capacity to be a Richard Feynman if we have the courage to go and embrace uncertainty and um, embrace our ignorance as a way to begin to start asking questions. Now, it turns out that every one of us is actually born with an innate uh, ability to be curious and to explore. You might actually remember that as children, when we are born, we are constantly exploring our environment. We're constantly touching things, tasting things, <laughs> constantly trying things on. We're natural experimenters who are constantly testing hypotheses. For example, this time when I was actually trying to figure out why it was that my bucket full of salamanders were refusing to eat a little piece of ground pork I had tied to the end of a string. <laughs> now the funny thing is that by the time we get to high school, this innate sense of exploration is actually replaced with this idea of, well, we gotta look cool, we gotta act cool. And as we probably all know now, we kind of miss the point sometimes. And in my case, well, I totally missed the point. <laughs> but as you might all remember, there is a cliche out there that says something along the lines of, behind every successful man is a great woman. And I would also argue that behind many successful children are very supportive parents. And I was definitely no different. Um, <laughs> yes, parents are awesome. Um, my, my dad used to love to challenge us every night with brain teasers and number games. And like every other nerdy child out there, we would sit there and we would beg for more every night after dinner. We really were sort of that sick. And so <laughs> what happened though was, you know, that really ended up being one of my inspirations for science. Now on the flip side, my mother, she was and still is an absolutely incredible woman. She had this incredible innate fear, it was this uncontrollable phobia of creepy crawlies and she was lucky enough to be landed with me, where that was my obsession, creepy crawlies. And the thing was that whenever I even had the, the courage to say to her, I'm curious about something, she would go out and she would magically make it happen. So for example, I'm sure she was thrilled when I was eight and I said to her, hey mom, I really want to learn what, how to raise silkworms. And she was like, okay, great. And you know, a couple months later on my birthday, she actually came and handed me a bottle of silkworm eggs. And I found out later that actually what she had done was she had spent weeks wandering the halls of Stanford University, randomly going into labs asking them if they had silkworm, sil silkworm eggs because, as you know, if you're part of a real research lab, you will have silkworm eggs. <laughs> and somehow this actually, the strategy actually worked out. She got me the silkworm eggs and like any other eight-year-old child, I immediately got bored of them and the next thing we knew, our house was infested with silkworms building cocoons all over the inside of the house. So it serves her right for being so supportive, right? So now when I got to high school, I clearly missed the memo of, oh, it's time to be cool and dress cool. And instead, I decided that really what I wanted to do was I wanted to see what it felt like to be a rocket scientist. So again, like any other great mom would have done, she goes out and she actually found an opportunity that I was able to apply for to land a position in a research lab at NASA Ames Research Center. So I actually ended up as a junior in high school conducting space physiology research under the mentorship of an incredibly, incredibly patient and very supportive man, Dr. Alan Hargens. And under his guidance and that of his lab, and with a ton of hard work from my end, I actually ended up with my first manuscript submitted and accepted at a real journal, which also ended up being my first ever first authored paper as a high school student. Thank you. 
Now, when I got to uh, Berkeley for my undergraduate, I ended up joining the polypedal laboratory, which was led by Dr. Robert Full. And he introduced me to the great and wondrous world of comparative biomechanics. And also to this idea that animals actually do play really well with robots, which I thought was the coolest thing in the world. And in his lab, what I started doing was I started studying how it was that geckos moved when they were running around. And what this meant was I got to pose some of the highest tech, cutting edge equipment. I was filming at 250 frames a second, 500, 1,000 frames per second, playing with these really awesome geckos. And I was loving it. But it turned out that what actually changed my life was not one of these really cute, beautiful, live geckos, but it was actually a dead one. <laughs> and the way this happened was I was actually headed down to the animal rooms this one day to go pick up a gecko because I was going to subject it to some more running in a trackway. And when I was down there, one of the animal techs came up to me and he said, hey, you know, you had another gecko die today. And he said, what, what would you like me to do with it? So like any other normal undergraduate, I said to him, well, why don't you give the gecko to me? And he goes, well, you realize it's dead, right? I'm like, yeah, 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 give me the gecko. So he gives me this gecko, and really the reason why I wanted a dead gecko was because I wanted to find out, I've been wondering about this for months, whether or not a dead gecko could still stick. So <laughs> this rather morbid experiment, I took <laughs> this dead gecko and I brought it up into the lab, and I looked for a nice smooth wall. And I found this door, I thought, okay, well, that'll do. So I took this gecko, and I stuck it to the door, and I smeared its toes down, and I let it go. And it stuck. And I thought, that's kind of cool. So now when I grabbed it, and I thought, well, now let's see what I can do with this dead gecko. And I started peeling its toes away one by one. And I wanted to see how few toes it really needed to be able to still stick. And I got it all the way down to one toe, and it was still hanging by that door. And I thought, hmm. So I grabbed its tail, pulled on it. Still felt pretty sturdy. So I looked around and I thought, I need something heavy. And I found this nice, big, heavy, solid metal sort of antique stapler. And of course, lying next to it, there was this you know, big pile of wire. So I took this pile of wire, wrapped it around the stapler, took the other end and I wrapped it around the hips of this, and this is a key point, dead gecko, <laughs> wrapped it around its hips, and I let the thing go. And the gecko proceeded to stick on this wall by a single toe, supporting its weight and the weight of this entire, entire stapler. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I gotta figure this out. <laughs> so the thing was that at the time, what we did know was we knew that geckos were not sticking using capillary adhesion, basically that means wet water adhesion. They weren't sticking by electromagnetic sort of forces, and we knew they weren't sticking by suction. So what I really wanted to do was I wanted to test whether or not they were sticking by this other force called van der Waals forces, which is this very, very weak intermolecular interaction that requires overlapping of electron clouds. Because <laughs> of course, that's how geckos stick. So I thought, well, the only way that I can really actually do this, obviously, is to go and measure the forces produced by the individual components of a gecko's toe pad. So scroll forward a number of years, 14 years to be precise, and I'm sitting in the back of a taxi cab with my now former undergraduate advisor, Bob Full, and we were headed actually off to Congress to brief them on the value of undergraduate research in their education. And he proceeded to say the following to me. I thought you were crazy when you said you wanted to measure the force produced by a single gecko ceta. And for me, this was really a moment of recognition. It was a really big moment of recognition for me to realize that really the discovery had, in that case, been driven by not knowing. Whether that means not knowing what is theoretically impossible, or not knowing what is the really cool mechanism that drives a really cool phenomenon. Now you might be asking yourself, why in the world would my former undergrad advisor think I was crazy? Well, to be quite honest, I kind of agree with him. And this is why. So a little bit of toe pad anatomy 101. In the upper left-hand corner, what you can see is the bottom of a gecko foot. Those little white tips on the tips of its toes are its toe pads. And basically, they look like, to the naked eye, as little chevron-shaped scales, modified scales. But if you go and you blow that up to magnify it to about 300 times, what you will see is it actually is composed of a whole series of little hairs. So that image on the left, magnified at 800 times, is one of those individual hairs removed. Now, if you were then to go and enlarge the tip of that little hair, this is what it looks like. It's a whole field of little tiny tips, hundreds of thousands of little tiny tips. 
and at 115,000 times magnification, that's what you'll see in the lower left-hand corner. These are called spatulae. Those little tiny hairs are called CD. Now, to give you an idea of the sense of scale of what we're dealing with here, as a schematic, on the right, what we have is a schematic of a gecko, toe hair or a seda. And there are approximately 2 million seedy per gecko. Okay? And if you look at the human hair, also schematic, obviously, on the left-hand side, a gecko seda is approximately 1 tenth to 1 thirtieth the diameter of a single human hair. And I was planning on going and removing a single one of those and measuring the force produced by a single one of those hairs. So that's why he thought I was crazy. And because I didn't know that technically it was impossible, we did it. So this is what we did with a help, with a lot of help actually, from a very creative group of people, a very smart group of people. What we were able to do was we found the finest insect pin we could possibly find, and we ground that down to make it even finer. We then removed a single one of those little hairs and we glued it to the tip of that pin. And then we used a little wire, very super fine wire, that we used as a force transducer or a force gauge. And what that allowed us to do is we could attach that little hair to the wire and then pull it across the screen. And by looking at how much we were able to displace that wire, we could calculate how much force that little hair was producing. And basically, based on those data, what we were actually able to calculate was that if you theoretically, theoretically, had a gecko about this big, not including its tail, and you were able to take every single one of those little hairs and attach it to, oh, say your five or seven year old child or brother or sister, you could actually pick them up and walk away with them. <laughs> so that's the amount of force. And yet, what they are using are these intermolecular forces, these van der Waal forces for attachment. And it's those little tiny tips that allow them to get so close to the surface that they can actually overlap the electron clouds. So those data, as well as that of a few other people that we worked with, resulted in a publication in Nature for me for my undergraduate research, which is truly awesome, especially because I checked the other day, just a couple of days ago, and we currently, for this one paper, have over 750 citations. <laughs> what I also didn't realize as an undergraduate was that this funny little idea in my head resulted in the development of an entirely new industry where people are out there looking to see how they can actually build biomimetic adhesives, which has always completely blown my mind. So where I am now as an assistant professor, it's really not all that coincidental. Really where I am right now is built on a lifelong interest of being really interested in biology and all the little animals out there and what they do. And then was supported by my family and my friends. And I ended up getting some pretty amazing opportunities. I got pretty lucky as far as that goes, as well as a group, a large group of really amazing mentors who helped me along. And ultimately, there was a lot of determination and sheer will on my part to make things work. But ultimately, none of this really would have been so successful if I didn't actually have an educational experience that was really focused on the idea of creativity and inquiry. And so this is who I am now. I'm a comparative biomechanist, albeit a very enthusiastic one. And I still, every day, I'm completely mesmerized by the natural world and all the animals that run around inside of it. My career lets me go to some pretty fabulous, breathtaking places. And in the lab, I get to study some pretty cool things, like how a lizard runs across water. And also, how do these really cool little fish out in Guam, how they actually walk about on land? They basically spend all their time out of water. And if you watch on here, what you'll see it do is it'll take its tail and it curls it next to its head, forms a C shape with its body, and then it pushes off and jumps. Now, they do have a little secret, it turns out, because they have other closely related relatives that can't do this. It's an incredibly beautiful, graceful motion. It turns out that what they have is they can actually take their tail, unlike other fish. So if you think about a fish, when you were growing up, a little kid, your mom was always saying to you, how does a fish swim? It swims like this one. Right? So <laughs> what these guys do is they actually take their tail, they turn it 90 degrees, and they put the lateral side of it against the ground. What you would see is it would actually curl its tail over, flatten the tail out, and it creates this very wide base of support, which then provides them with greater friction and a greater ability to direct the, to direct the forces into the ground. 
And I'm now working with a couple really wonderful um, researchers, physicists actually, over at Georgia Tech, where we're studying how this cool little lizard runs on sand. What these animals are able to do is they can run on sand and on solid ground at the exact same speed. And what we've been able to find out is we can take this information that we're learning from these lizards and we can tell a robot how to actually run on sand. So in this case, what we've got is a robot that has been just told to run as if it would if it was actually on solid ground. And basically what it would do is it would dig itself a hole. It doesn't move at all. What we did was we went and we took the timing characteristics and we input that into this robot. And by doing so, what it actually ends up doing is it actually makes progress across the sand. So what this shows us is we can really take, truly take biology and integrate it into robotics and actually teach our robots something that they never once knew. Okay, so I just wanted to leave you with a final thought. I really hope that I've managed to convince you today that discovery and innovation is not purely driven by knowledge. And in fact, in a lot of ways, is driven by what we don't know. So what I want you to do today is take some time out of your busy schedules and out of your hectic days and find the courage to go and open your mind and start asking those questions. Figure out what you don't know and start the process of exploration. What you discover may be a surprise to us all. Thank you.